danger. The world's most dangerous morning show, DJ Envy. Captain of this bitch, Angela Yee. I stay in everybody's business, but in a good way. Charlemagne the God. The ruler of rubbing you the wrong way. The Breakfast Club. Pay for everybody. Good morning, USA. Yo, 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 yo
And I started on the voting rights issues long, long ago. That's what got me involved in politics in the first place. Now, Senator Manchin has some criticism about uh, people telling him what he needs to do. The rule book means that the rules changes are done on the basis of broad bipartisan consensus, not imposed on the minority by raw majority power, no matter who's in power. Now my colleagues propose to sidestep this process. They would use the nuclear option to override a rule that we have used ourselves, but now seem to find unacceptable. We're going to break the rules to change the rules. To make up new rules as we go along, invite them, ourselves to future majorities to disregard the rule book at will. No rule of the Senate can withstand the act of a willful majority. Let this change happen in this way, and the Senate will be a body without rules. Now that's in regards to getting rid of the filibuster because Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer said Democrats would seek a carve out to the filibuster rule to pass voting rights legislation by replacing that 60 vote threshold needed to break a filibuster with an old fashioned uh, talking filibuster. So. They just don't care about black people voting people. That's all. Because if you can't get rid of the filibuster, uh, a filibuster, or carve out something in the filibuster to preserve the cornerstone of democracy, voting rights, it's because your voting rights aren't threatened. You don't care if black people can vote. No, nah, he just said he F with us. He said he just got to come out and see us more. That was Joe Biden. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, here's what Joe Biden has to say about things that he has done. He did a solo news conference ahead of his one year mark in office yesterday. A whole yesterday bunch of nothing. This. Here's what he said Your spending package, voting rights legislation, they're not going anywhere. So, That's true. <laughs> is there anything that you are confident you can get signed into law before the midterm elections? Yes, I'm confident we can get uh, pieces, big chunks of the uh, Build Back Better law signed into law. And I'm confident that we can take the case to the American people that the people they should be voting for who are going to oversee whether the elections, in fact, are legit or not, should not be those who are being put up by the Republicans to, de to determine that they're going to be able to change the outcome of the election. I think the, be the most important thing to do is try to inform, not educate, inform the public of what's at stake in oh, stark God. terms. Yesterday, he said the 2020, 2022 midterm elections, if they don't get some voting rights passed, will probably be uh, uh, illegitimate. That's what he said, right? Or they'll probably be, you know, interference. Duh. So that would be all the more reason to try to get some voting rights legislation passed. All right. Well, we have more of that in the next hour on Front Page News. And I also want to say, man, salute to Joe Madison and all the pastors who are on a hunger strike until voter rights are passed. Please go eat. All right, please. Voting rights legislation died on the Senate floor last night, but you don't have to. Please go eat. All right? I'm begging y'all to go out there and have a meal this morning. I'll send y'all cash app money if you need it, man. Please don't starve yourself no more waiting on uh, these politicians to do the right thing because they not. Please. All, All right? right? Joe Madison, please go have a meal. Please, sir. All right. Get it off your chest. 800-585-1051. If you're upset, you need to vent. Call us up right now. Phone lines are wide open. Again, 800-585-1051. It's The Breakfast Club. Good morning. The Breakfast Club. This is your time to get it off your chest, whether you're mad or blessed. So you better have the same energy. We want to hear from you on The Breakfast Club. Hello, hey. who's this? This is Anthony. Hey, what's up, brother? Get it off your chest. Yo, I'm just calling about the voting rights. Best thing we can do is get our ducks in a row and just go ahead and just start voting however it is they need us to vote so that way we won't hold ourselves back. What do you mean? So they're trying to stop us from voting, right? Mm -hmm. So the best thing we can do is whatever it is they want us to comply to, let's comply to it, and that way we can win the election. And what's gonna you know happen, what's gonna happen then? Did you tell me? That's what I'm trying to. That's what I'm trying to tell y'all. This is the same. Listen, Democrats run the same play, <clears throat> same play every single time. During the presidential election, it was like, okay, we get the White House, we get the Senate, change will happen. They got the White House, they got the Senate, nothing's happening. Hello, who's this? Oh, good morning. Um, this is Evelyn. I'm um, speaking. Uh, good morning to you, um, DJ Envy, Shalamini God, and Miss E. Good morning. Um, Good morning. Well, I just wanted to get this off my chest concerning the voting uh, right bill that just um, died on the Senate floor yes, last night. Yes, mm -hmm. ma'am. Um, these politicians, <laughs> they are just playing games. Uh, and we citizens, we need to get educated. We need to know what we need to do. We need to vote these people out. That's our job. Right. We need to do our research. 
and we need to vote them out. And Democrats, all these poli- political um, politicians, they so-called Democrats, they need to have a clear understanding that they need to do what they need to do. Republicans, they do whenever whenever it's their turn, they make things happen. That's right. They or fall they, in line. They, have they, they fall in line. So Democrats, they need to get their house in order. I don't understand why they keep playing games and having this argument back and forth. Get your house in order. Yep, this yep. is the problem. Yeah, me. Did you see yesterday when they asked Joe Biden, did he even reach out to any Republicans about voting rights? And he was like, "No, I didn't get a chance to because I was too busy trying to get people on my own team to get aboard." And, and see, that's the problem right there. This is a guy that has been in the Senate for over thirty something years. Yep. He knows how to talk to Republicans, but if his house is not in order, how can he reach out to the other guys in the Republicans and say, "Hey, guys, come along"? He can't do that. It doesn't even make any sense. Because the first thing that we're telling him, oh, by the way, Mr. Mr. President, we still have two senators that is holding out. Why are you talking to us? Why are you talking to us? Right. So that's number one. And number two, I don't understand why Democrats can't just get in line. Just get in line. Do what you need to do. Yeah, and- Make things happen. Yeah, and if Manchin and Cinema don't want to get in line, how come Democrats don't challenge for their seats? Hello, who's this? Good morning, my comedy buddy, Angela. Is this Snack Man? Oh my goodness. Happy birthday. My birthday was two weeks ago, bro. Month. Why are you hating on it? Right, thank you, Snack Man. I appreciate it. We miss you. I don't know who we is. Who's we? All of us. Hey, oh, not me. Too. This is perfect. Listen, acronyms. You are going to agree with me on this one. Okay. What the hell is acronyms? You don't know what an acronym is? Of, yeah, but he said who? Got he, acronyms. Who is acronym? Oh my God, after all these years, Angela, I never told you about my previous comedy buddy. Like me and her, we practiced in Manhattan up to the time I placed third in the Staten Island Comedy Festival. Oh God. In 2007. Her initials are AS. So acronyms, you and I agree. Um, okay, uh, I'm funnier than her. Who the hell is acronyms? Than me. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so um, the joke, Angela, your birthday joke. You ready? I'm ready. I like dating African American women oh, because then I have something in common with airplanes. What's that? I don't already. Yeah, yo, we both got a black box. Thank you. Boo! Get this oh, man God. the hell off the stage. <laughs> Boo! <laughs> By the way, there was something there. You know what I mean? It just, you know, there was. It's a little awkward. There was something there. Nope. Just, okay, snack man. Okay, all right. Ooh, 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 Get ooh. it off your chest. 800 585 1051. Call us now. It's The Breakfast Club. Good morning. The Breakfast Club. 800 585 1051. We want to hear from you on The Breakfast Club. <laughs> Hello, who's this? I'm at Duval. Duval, What's Jacksonville. Up, What's happening, my brother? Get it off What's your going chest. On? Good morning, y'all. Good morning. Good morning. morning. Yeah, man. I just want to give a shout out to my black queen, man. We've been together this last year, man. I come home to a meal, cooked every day, clothes ready for me to put on when I come home. Yeah, man. In this last year, she allowed me to be the man of the house. You feel me? She allowed you. <laughs> she allowed you to be the man of the house. Yeah, man. Not trying to take control of. You know, man. Wow. I don't think it got to be gender. It's just that she allowed you to be the CEO of the house. Because, you know, if you are... Yeah, it, it, all, all, exactly. all of us men all of us men know who the CEO of our houses are. You got to know it. All right, brother. Have a good one. Yes, sir. Y'all too. Hello. Who's this? What up, man? This is Wayne Busy straight out of Detroit, man. What up, dog? I'm, I'm calling y'all to give a shout out to my city, man. We've been tearing it up. PZ, Bezo, Babyface Ray. Baby money, the whole gang, we've been going crazy, man. Okay. I just want to talk the whole city. I That's love it. it. Baby face Ray. I love Detroit rappers. I swear Vezo, yeah. Sada Baby. Charlemagne, you need to let us come up there some more, man. Call the D up there, man. That's what you need to do. Salute to my guy Vezo, man. I was, I was talking to Vezo a couple weeks ago. Come up here and do what? You want rap? Do whatever, dude, man. That's Tommy, not how this works. That <laughs> you can't just come up here and do whatever. That's not how this works, brother. Hello, who's this? This is Quita from Atlanta. What's up, Quita? Good morning, Quita. Hey, I talked to you guys a couple months ago, back in November. Not sure if you guys remember. 
Um, and I had my daughter with me, and I kind of gave you guys my cash up, and you guys helped me out. You know, I was very gracious in that. But I was calling you guys. I want to kind of get something out of the way and also talk to you guys and get some advice on what I could possibly do. But um, if you don't remember, I'm a single mother of five. I live here in Atlanta, and my children's father, you know, doesn't help me. They, my kids have the same father. But... Um, I had kind of got some feedback from some of the people, like someone cashed at me and said, hey, get a job. And I wanted to kind of touch on that a little bit. <laughs> what? Hold on, talk about, talk about. You can cash out people and, and leave messages like yeah, that? Yeah, that's how people, if you block somebody, <laughs> they'll send a cash app like and send you like a dollar with a message in case you block them Damn. so that you get to see it. I never knew yes. that. Yeah, you can how much did they leave you when they told you get a job? They sent a dollar and said, get a job. But this Damn. is the thing, okay? <laughs> not only do I not get help from my kid's father, um, I'm kind of an entrepreneur, but also with the car problems, I really can't go and to my clients' houses and do hair because I don't have a car. But the thing is, I can't work because I'm waiting on disability. I was diagnosed with a disability back in March. So, you know, did my interview and the lady like, hey, you know, you can't work. I don't, you know, you won't get approved. So you can't have a job. And I'm like, well, I have kids to take care of. So, of course, things I'm not supposed to, I'm not supposed to work, but I still do hair when I can, if I can get to my clients. But anyway, I'm calling today because I need some type of advice um, on my daughter. Um, she's going through, and I, it mainly has something to do with their dad, you know, not really being that involved, but she's having like emotional issues, you know, and it's things that I really don't understand and I can't you know, get through to. So first, Charlamagne, can you please send me your book? I do need your book. That may help. How many? Um, how many can you see? You got five kids, right? They all they all can read. Of course. No, I'm talking about are they reading age? Is what I mean because yes, you know they are. They okay, are. Okay. They're teenagers. They're teenagers. So yes, they do read. But you don't have to send that many copies. I mean, we do share things. So I'm gonna send you I mean, some. Maybe a couple. I'm gonna send you. Okay. I'm gonna send you the unapologetic guide to Black Mental Health by Dr. Rita Walker and Shallow Waters by Anita Kopak. And I'm gonna send you Tamika Mallory's State of Emergency. Thank you so much. Okay, one more thing, one more thing, <laughs> one more thing. So I do, I also, because people just didn't understand my situation and they felt like, oh, she's just asking for money, but that's not the thing. I get I get help from no one. Like, I struggle, hustle, and do what I can do by myself. And it's not... Queen. Listen, Queen, you don't you have to explain, explain yeah. yourself no, no, no. to yeah. nobody, okay? But, if you, if, that, that's just for the people that understand where I'm coming from. Like, blessings, the blessings are needed. And I also want you guys to pray for me and my family. My mother is, like, literally on her dying bed right now. Um, but, like, I've I just been dealing with so much. But, my, like I said, my cash up is QUI1984. For people that truly want to help me, I would appreciate the help. We, we, we like I said, you do not have to explain Hold yourself on, to on. nobody, Queen. We totally understand, okay? And guess what? If a million people all send you a dollar and tell you get a job, it don't matter. You got a million dollars. Get it off your chest. 800-585-1051. Now, we got rumors on the way, E? And we'll be talking Nick Cannon. You know, he said he's insecure about being naked when he's having sex. We'll tell you what else he had to say. The Breakfast Club. Let's talk Nick Cannon. Listen up. It's just in. All the guys. Guys. The Rumor Report. Guys. Guys. With Angela. Angela Yee. It's the Rumor Report. The Breakfast Club. Well, yesterday on the Nick Cannon Show, Nick Cannon was doing a man panel, and he was talking about some of his own insecurities when it comes to having sex. Are there any insecurities uh, when it comes to the, the bedroom? I'm going to tell you uh, off top, I definitely have an insecurity mm -hmm. when it comes with uh, being intimate and Rip was just yeah. making fun of. I'm I'm actually, I've been skinny all my life. Yeah. So therefore, I've never liked to be completely naked. Oh. When, so like, it's it, it's it's usually, or like I hide under the cover. Yeah. As much oh, as I, I, yeah. I boast about being yeah. in shape and yeah. stuff. Just keep like yeah, that's interesting. Shirt on. You ever Winnie the Pooh? Winnie? <laughs> <laughs> that's my thing. I just, I gotta have some type of clothes, some, some type yeah. of sock. So that's my insecurity. Yeah. Anybody yeah. else? That shouldn't matter if that's long, slonging though, right? If that thing hanging, it shouldn't matter. You're fine with it. Yeah, it just shouldn't matter. You know what I mean? Like, okay, I mean, me, per me personally, I hide the shrinkage. You know what I mean? I don't want nobody to see me when I'm fresh out the shower. You know, I don't want my, you know, my wife to see me after. You know, I, I ejaculate and I've been laying there for a while because you know the Hulk turns back to Bruce Banner. 
I don't want that. I don't, I don't want to care. see that. I, look, I don't care. It's out the shower, in the shower, after the jack. It don't matter. No, no, no. Shrinkage is my insecurity. I don't want that. No, no, no. I'm That's a grow. Right, I'm a, I don't care. I'm a grow, not a show. I need to be my best self at all times. Yeah, maybe you got, you got that little problem. And it's great because when a guy so does, a when different. he's done and it's small, you, it's smaller, it's nice to be. Like, I know, oh, right? It's really relaxed. Like, you just yeah. be like. You be like, look, I've never seen it so little. No, 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 no. And then he really, yeah, yeah I don't want that. insecure. Mm-hmm. But that's him talking about his own insecurity, and clearly it stems from him having been skinny his whole life or whatever. So I'm sure mm-hmm. when he's comfortable enough, you know. But- he ain't that shamed about it, all them kids he got. Somebody seen him naked. <laughs> <Yeah. yet. laughs> no, he doesn't say he doesn't get naked. He's just a little insecure about it because I guess he's thinking about being used to being skinny and being insecure about that. Mm-hmm. All right, now uh, let's talk about Megan Good. So she's single now, and she posted up a picture. She's, you know, Megan has always been in really good shape, it seems like, ever since I've first seen her in Eve's Bayou. Um, So a lot of people were talking about that, and they're like, all right, Megan, uh, you know, back back out here. But one thing she did talk about on the Kelly Clarkson show was the show Harlem. I know you guys watched some of that. Harlem on Prime, Amazon Prime. And one thing she talked about was Whoopi Goldberg helping her with her lines. She's so nice. Yeah. And like whenever you meet people, you're like, oh God, please let them be don't, wonderful. Don't fail me. Don't ruin <laughs> yeah, it for me, yeah, you know? Yeah. And um, I remember there was one day I kept saying uh, Seneca instead of Seneca Village. Yeah. And she was like, it's, it's Seneca. It's, it's Seneca Village, Seneca Village. I was like, okay. So then I come in and I like butcher her coverage saying the line wrong. <laughs> and then on my coverage, I come in and she's taped it with the pronunciation <laughs> across her boobs. <laughs> and I'm like, Seneca, she was like, I was like, look oh. at my boobs. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I am trying to help you. Exactly. That's dope. That's good. OG mm-hmm. helping the younger. Yeah, that's cute. There's certain words you just always pronounce wrong. And the other people could pronounce it right all the time, but for some reason in your head, you're pronouncing it oh. a certain way. Believe me, I know. That's every, that's every word I probably yeah, utter. Just, <laughs> Believe me, I know. At least know. every other word. Now, we told you guys about Cardi B helping out with the funeral costs for all the victims mm-hmm. of the Bronx apartment fire. Uh, so one of the... Uh, one of the relatives of a Bronx fire victim has called Cardi B an angel for paying for a funeral costs. Uh, this woman's niece was killed in the blaze along with her husband and three children, and she doesn't have to worry about finding the money to bury her five family members. And so he said it's a huge help to his family to not have to bear that financial burden. He's sending Cardi blessings for stepping up to help so many people who she's never even met. All right, drop on the clues, Bronx for Body, man. Cardi B. I said it yesterday. You can say a lot of things about Cardi, but you cannot question her heart in any way, shape, or form. And I love to see people do things that somebody can't hate on. And if they do, if they do say something negative about it, then you, you, you it's more about hater. yourself. Okay? Yeah, Correct. you just know you're a hater if you say something negative about that. All right, now trade the truth. Prayers to him. He was involved in a car accident and hospitalized as a result of the incident. For real? He shared all of this on Instagram. Yes, um, a couple of days ago, he said one thing after another. The devil couldn't stop me if he wanted to, and the evil certain people who tried to pray evil on me. Tell him I'm gonna look at that ish and walk it down. On the hospital, back to it. Out of the hospital, back to it. God sent. Yeah, hey, salute to my guy, Trey Truth. I got hit him up. I didn't know that. You know, Trey's one of those people you always wonder who does the go to guy go to. Mm-hmm. Like, he's always providing relief for so many people along, you know, with Mr. Rogers and the whole relief gang. It's like, you know, who's. Who's there for Trey when he when he needs? Yeah, it. shout out to Trey, shout out to Mr. Salute Rogers. To Trey, man. Mm-hmm. All right, and then there's a rumored new celebrity Big Brother cast. I saw a lot of people talking about this. Shout out to Baller Alert. I saw them post this also. Uh, some of the people that could be on Celebrity Big Brother, what they're saying: Lamar Odom, Nene, Neo, Tiffany Pollard, Shikari Richardson. I mean, this sounds like a nice house. What is Celebrity watch. Big Brother? Yeah, I know the same show. thing. Yeah, what, what, is what is Big Brother? Uh, it, it was a spinoff of the regular show Big Brother where they're constantly under surveillance in a house and then they did a celebrity Big Brother. So it's... Oh, so it's like, like Big house. Brothers yeah, watching? Yeah, and there's always oh, okay. cameras everywhere. Okay. So there's always kind of all kinds of drama um, on there. But it's a social experiment. They take you out of normal society, put you in the house, and it's all different people with different backgrounds, different beliefs, and you have to avoid being eliminated. So you're all fighting to win a grand prize. That grand prize is $250,000. Mm. All right. Well, that is your rumor report. All right. We got front page news. Next, what are we talking about? Yes. And let's get more into Joe Biden and the press conference he had today is one year since he's been president. All right. We'll get into that next. It's The Breakfast Club. Good morning. Let's go. It's time to wake up. Yeah. It's The Breakfast Club. It's going going down. Angela Yee here. And my friends at the General Insurance give you quality car insurance for less. Check out their affordable rates and flexible payment options by calling 800-GENERAL or visiting thegeneral.com. 
The General Auto Insurance Services, Inc., an insurance agency, Nashville, Tennessee. Some restrictions apply. Morning, everybody. It's DJ NV Angela Yee, Charlemagne the Guy. We are the Breakfast Club. Let's get some front page news. Where are we starting? Well, yesterday, Joe Biden had a solo news conference. We played some of it during the first front page news break. Now let's talk more about what he had to say. And one thing he discussed was uh, being realistic and about his plan. He needs to be out there. American people overwhelmingly agree with me on prescription drugs. They overwhelmingly agree with me on the cost of education. They overwhelmingly agree with me on early education. They overwhelmingly go on the list on, on, on child care. And so we just have to make the case of what we're for and what the other team's not for. And one of the things that I think is we're going to have to do is just make the case. I don't think there's anything unrealistic about what we're asking. I'm not trying to, I'm not asking for castles in the sky. I'm asking for practical things the American people have been asking for for a long time. What is he talking about? He also what? says he didn't overpromise. He said I had probably outperformed yes, what anybody thought would happen. What? I, I want to know what is he talking about? Who is he talking to? He's the president. Why does he sound like he's on the campaign trail? You're the president. You're in charge now. He also went to Twitter and said in our first year in office, we created 6.4 million jobs. That's the biggest year of job creation in American history. In perspective, though, a lot of people were out of work because of COVID and mm-hmm. a lot of businesses were not in. So you should have the biggest um, job creation in American history because there were so many jobs lost. A lot of people resigned, too. Because of COVID. Mm-hmm. And then he also tweeted out, in our first year, we achieved a record number of jobs created, a record drop in the unemployment rate, a record drop in unemployment claims. We're <sighs> getting America back to work. There was a record drop in unemployment claims because a lot of people resigned. A lot of people realized that they can make money doing a lot of other things. And so they decided to be this entrepreneurs. The great resignation. Absolutely. Time right now. They decided now, to be entrepreneurs and they quit their jobs. Another thing he talked about was his next term. There's three <laughs> things I'm going to do differently. Number one, I'm going to go out and talk to the public. Number two, I'm also going to be out there seeking the more advice of experts outside, from academia to editorial writers to think tanks, and I'm bringing them in. And the third thing that I'm going to be doing a lot more. I'm, I'm going to be deeply involved in the off these off year elections to go out and make the case in plain, simple language <sighs> as to what it is we've done, what we want to do, and why we think it's important. There is no next term, President Biden. You're going to yeah. lose the midterms this year, and when you lose the midterms and the Republicans get, Republicans get control of the House and the Senate, you damn sure ain't going to be able to get nothing done. You can't get nothing done now, so you damn sure ain't going to get nothing done then. You're well, not one question on 2024 ambitions, he did say that Vice President Kamala Harris would be his running mate. Mm-hmm. It was a two-hour press conference that he had, and another thing he discussed was giving away 400 million N95 masks. That's all going to start next week, too. So they did stockpile all of these masks, uh, and they have more than 750 million of them on hand. You know, it's been hard for people to find those N95 masks. They say those are the ones that offer the most protection. Mm-hmm. So they are going to make those available for free to U.S. residents starting next week. What I don't understand is the voting rights legislation hasn't passed, and they have made it hard for black people to vote all over the country, and Biden hasn't gotten any of his campaign promises done for black people. How and why is he expecting black people to vote for him uh, in, the, in, in the next election? How is he already talking about another term? Well, they, what he say hey, to you don't think that's arrogant? Yeah, but what did he say to you? Well, yeah, if you don't vote for me, you ain't black. That's mm-hmm. still his mindset. No, yeah. you're right. Mm-hmm. You're right. He still he, he still think y'all niggas going to go out there and write. <laughs> Well, they asked him about his ambitions for 2024, so that's why he addressed it. He was questioned about it. Listen, I'm going to vote because, you know, that's just... And I'm going to tell everybody else to get out there and vote and don't let them suppress your vote. No, because that clearly, I'm not doing. There, I am. I'm telling everybody y'all need to get out there and vote. I want everyone to exercise their rights. I'm going to vote because I am... They're trying to take away from us because of the power that we have. Yeah, but even when we do vote, they get in and don't do anything. But I'm going to vote because I'm a taxpaying American citizen but for anybody out there who feels like they don't want to I understand why but you, I mean, you, you still understand. have to you people, have to people vote don't have and to. I'm, yes, people you feel do. like you know I don't like, like you don't have you know to. what because a lot of people tell me you can't they don't want to vote for Biden vote. right they don't want to vote for Biden they don't feel Biden represents them but they don't want to vote Republican so what do they do no they feel like yeah, these people aren't getting anything done yeah but it's not just the president in the midterms you're not voting for that I thought you were talking about these people are feeling like they're not getting anything done When we, you know what I hate is the fact that we're always putting pressure on the voters to get things done. When we gonna put pressure on them to get things done? They running around here saying, oh, you gotta vote like democracy depends on it. When y'all gonna govern like democracy depends on it? 
Why do we always got to have the sense of urgency? Why not them? Well, it should be both. I think it should be both. It should I be think both. that if you don't vote, then we go harder on people who who say things like, "Man, I don't want to vote because I don't feel like nothing's getting done." Then we do the people who are actually in positions of power right now. You know, not doing anything. That dude sounds like I he's still on the campaign trail and he's the president. You also have to look at your local elections, though. And yes, those are really I agree important. with that. So you have to get out and vote. You're not just voting for the president, and it's midterms. Coming I agree up. with that. Hyper so you have to get out there and vote. And I I would never encourage people not to or tell them you feel discouraged. You have to do your Why part. Why can't you say you feel discouraged? Because that's your part, and your part is awesome. I mean, you can feel discouraged, but don't not vote. You should vote. feel discouraged. Right. This is, that's what democracy is about. Democracy is about challenging these elected officials. Democracy is telling them that we don't feel good about what's going on. What you mean? And you get out there and speak, and you have to make sure that your vote, you vote for people that you feel like represent you, and then put the pressure on them. And it is important to for us to also strategize, come together, and make sure that we make demands and make sure our voices are heard. But All if you're not voting, and who cares? The they don't care about you if you're not voting. It's the same most song. They don't care about us when we do vote. It's showing I, know, us I, that have right some, now. I have some local <laughs> officials who I really local. Yes, and I'm hyper local. One hundred percent. I'm hyper local. I agree with that. So that's all about voting. So, lo- vote so you mean vote, vote on a local? We're level. talking about midterms right now, right? Midterms coming up. I thought we were talking about him saying setting up. Yeah, I thought you were talking about his next term, twenty twenty four. That's what I thought we were talking about. We're talking about both, though. I mean, uh, midterms are what's coming up next. Wow. Well, all right, what, and that is your front page. News. Like I said, you know, there's, I don't see how how he plans, you know, to win in the midterms. I really don't. When, when when voter rights legislation hasn't been passed, they're making it hard for black people to vote, and he hasn't gotten any of his campaign promises done to black people. I don't know how he expects a, a high voter black turnout. They're making the it hard terms. for us to vote because of how important voting is. So don't be discouraged and not vote because that's what they want you to do. That is a form of voter suppression. When so, they tell you... You know what else is a form of voter suppression? When you got people in power who promise things and they don't get those things done. That's a form of voter suppression, too, because it discourages voters to not come out. Please All right. vote. Ladies, ladies, ladies. All right. Shut up. <laughs> Thank you so much, ladies. No All problem. Right. Now, when we come back, Shaka Singo will be joining us, all right? New York mm-hmm. Times bestselling, of course. He's the author of Writing My Wrongs, and he has a new book, Letters to the Sons of Society, A Father's Invitation to Love, Honesty, and Freedom. We're going to talk to him next. It's The Breakfast Club. Good morning. The Breakfast Club. The Breakfast Club. Your mornings will never be the same. Morning, everybody. It's DJ Envy, Angela Yee, Charlamagne the Guy. We are the Breakfast Club. We got a special guest in the building. Yes, indeed. What's He's up? back. The brother Shaka Singor. The good welcome. brother Shaka Singor. Oh man, thank y'all so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. So welcome back, brother. First of all, how, how are you doing with COVID and and everything that's been going on in this crazy world? I'm blessed. Just you know, taking it one day at a time. You know, I think I got a very unique experience that kind of prepared me for these isolated moments. So I've been good, man. Just really. Taking an opportunity to be more creative, more thoughtful about life, more present with the people in my life, and taking it one step at a time. But I'm ready for it to be over to get back to living freely. I don't think without, it's ever going to be over. Nah, the world as we know nah. is never going to be the same. Well, let's yeah. flash back because Shaka was here before. He was talking about his book, Writing My Wrongs, and now he has another New book. New York out. Times bestseller. <laughs> Yes, yeah. letters to the sons of society. And yeah. when you reference uh, COVID and isolation, mm-hmm. I saw you were talking about how when you were locked up, in seven years you spent in um, solitary confinement yeah. and the comparison to COVID. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I think it's very different, but I think one of the things, and I, I actually talk about it in the book, that's similar is the kind of disorienting effect of not knowing when something is going to end or normalize. Mm-hmm. And people was like, well, how would you compare that to those two things? But when I was in solitary, my senses was indeterminate. So they never told me when I was getting out. And I think the same thing has kind of happened early on. It was like, oh, we'll be done with this in a couple of months. We'll be done maybe six months. And, you know, we're almost two years later and we still don't know. So it just kind of makes it hard for you to put your feet on solid ground. And I wanted to be sensitive to the reality that people were facing with so that people can get themselves grace and understand that it's, it's a real thing. It's not something that they're imagining is difficult. It really is difficult. That makes perfect sense to me. Yeah. Like, it sounds like the perfect uh, analogy. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, yeah. but I guess if, if you've never been in solitary <laughs> confinement, <laughs> right. you don't understand. Yeah, I mean, now this is not quite solitary. Yeah, you know, yeah, we still yeah, can yeah. get real food and all those things, but I think psychologically what happens, mm-hmm. and I mean, you know, you talk a lot about mental health, which I really respect, uh, but mentally what goes on is is the most important part. And, you know, I tell people all the time, like, I got free from prison mentally before I ever walked out of prison. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's one of the reasons I'm able to do some of the things that I do now because that recognition that the, the worst prison we'll ever be in is our mind was something I was able to acknowledge early on in my incarceration, and that helped me get through. Mm-hmm. Well, you have a new book. 
Yeah. Letters to the Sons of Society. A Father's Invitation to Love, Honesty, and Freedom. What, what does that mean? I mean, you know, as as a dad, I've had two very unique experiences. Which is crazy. When you think about it, it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's wild. Yeah, when I was arrested, my oldest son's mom was still pregnant with him, so he was born like six months after my incarceration. And so I only experienced fatherhood with him through my dad bringing my son to visit me, you know? And so basically I kind of made up this narrative about being a good dad and being a present dad because I was able to write letters and get phone calls, um, but I wasn't able to really spend the time that's necessary to nurture a child uh, through the world. And you know, now I had this wonderful experience of raising my now 10 year old son, Sekou. Uh, he's a young entrepreneur, he's creative, very intelligent. And it's dramatically different, you know? But I'm also different too as a man. Like I'm a grown man. When I went to prison, I was a 19 year old kid. And so, you know, this book really is a reflection of those experiences, but it's actually a little bit deeper. You know, I mentor young people all over the country. You know, you go through what I've been through with prison where I spent 19 years of my life. And most of the guys I spent time with were kids. Mm -hmm. And so for me, you know, working with young men across the country, I'm like, this is the book I want to write. So I start off like letters to my hip hop sons, letters to my young entrepreneurial sons, and then I realized between all the young men that I get a chance to mentor existed my two sons. And I felt the intimacy would come through more if I just wrote directly to them about life and what I've experienced, but also what I wish for them and dealt with some of the issues that we're faced with. What is your oldest son? How, how is your relationship with him? Because, you know, mm. him being older now, he's looking at you and your younger son right now and how the fact that you could be there and that you are at his games and you are helping him with his homework and all those things. But I mean, I'm sure he feels like, damn, I, I wasn't, I didn't have that part of my dad. So how was your relationship? I mean, it's very complex. You know, my, my oldest son is now 30 years old. And when I came home and I talk about it, one of the, one of the most impactful chapters, I think that people are really going to resonate is the first resonate with is the first chapter because it really explains the complexity of coming home to a young man um, and trying to insert my life and myself into his life as his dad. And really, I came home as a mentor. Yo, this is how we're going to do it. We're going to make these things happen. And I don't got to listen to you. Yeah, and it wasn't fair to him. You know, it wasn't fair for me to come home because the story I had was contracted to the reality of being in prison. And so it's been a, it's been a very difficult, it's probably been the most complex part of my life and the hardest thing I've ever had to confront as a man. And that's where the honesty and then the title comes from is as dads, Oftentimes we're not honest, whether it's honest about the things that are positive or honest about our shortcomings. And I really wanted to create space for fathers to really have honest discussions, especially when we think about what's happening with black males in our communities. Why yeah, is you there... talk about what you did do when you came home and your son obviously felt like, well, you can't just come and change my life and tell me what to do now because mm -hmm. you haven't been present as a father. So a lot of people have had to deal with that when they get out of jail because we don't even think about that, right? What is that relationship like? Can I just step back in 19 years later as a dad and tell you how to do things when you've been doing things your own way? So what advice do you have for fathers out there who are trying to get back into their children's life? My advice is always to take the, you know, the guidance of the child um, because, you know, we owe them, they don't owe us anything. Mm -hmm. And I think it's really important to be patient, to give yourself grace, but also to acknowledge that, you know, it was your decisions that took you out of their life and not their decisions to not be present. And so what I've tried to do is just be patient now and be, you know, allow him to kind of set the tone for our engagement with no expected outcomes. And I've really detached my ego from parenting not just with him, but also with my younger son. And what about with the mom, too? Because that's yeah. also an issue. Because now you want to make sure that you have this time. And if, you know, at first your son isn't comfortable or certain things are going on. Because we've had people call up here with issues like that. Well, you know, the mom is has a new boyfriend. She's moved on. She's done mm -hmm. this. And I need to, to this to happen for me with my son. And she's not helping with the relationship. How did that dynamic work? I mean, I think that one was a little bit more complex because my dad really stepped in and kind of filled the gap, so to speak. Um, so he and my oldest son's mom, they kind of had almost like a parent-child relationship. You know, he stepped in, you know, as a, as a, my dad is just incredible. He's a really incredible human being. And so he kind of raised her, you know. So by the time I came home, my son was grown, so we didn't have to have as much engagement 
But there were moments, uh, you know, and again, I talk about it in that first chapter where I had to reach out to her like, hey, this is what's happening with me and him. And I'm not trying to go back to the old way that I was living, but I will if, you know, if I get pushed to that point. And so just being able to have that understanding with her was really what important mean, old, and helpful. The old way you were living, what you mean? Yeah, I was super triggered. We had a we had a very intense moment. So you your know? son wasn't going down the right path and you was... Well, no, we got into like a real conflict. And mm-hmm. and that happens often, you know, especially with guys coming home from the joint. Like I've, I've been in the joint on the yard, thugging it out, going through all the, the violent realities of that and, and that experience. Mm-hmm. And what I didn't account for is I hadn't healed from that PTSD. Mm-hmm. And so there was a moment when me and my son got into a conflict and he physically threatened me. And I told his mom, like, you know, you need to holler at him because otherwise I'm gonna take him over here and leave him in his field. And if something actually happened where we thought that's what went down with my son. Mm-hmm. And that's what I talk about in that first chapter. All right, we got more with Shaka and Gore. When we come back, don't move. It's the Breakfast Club. Good morning. Morning, everybody. It's DJ Envy, Angela Yee, Charlemagne the Guy. We are the Breakfast Club. We're still kicking it with Shaka and Gore. You know, he's a New York Times bestselling author for Writing My Wrongs and has a new book called Letters to the Sons of Society, A Father's Invitation to Love, Honesty, and Freedom. Charlemagne? How long did it take you to get out of that uh, that survival mode of, of fighting? Like, I got to protect myself at all times. How long did it take you to, to get out of that? Actually, that, that experience with my son was the first time I had really re- realized that I hadn't fully processed all that out of my system. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, when I, was, when I did that last stretch in solitary... I just came out focused on life at the prison. And I didn't, first of all, I didn't know if I was ever getting out, but I had wrote down all the things I wanted to manifest in my life because I believe you attract into your life what you think about the most. And so I started living my life in that way, but it's still the big yard and I still was who I am on the yard. So I had to navigate that first. Um, and I was fortunate, you know, like I had reached that status of respect where I didn't have to deal with all the conflicts, but it also set me up for the reality of what happens when you get home and nobody cares about your transformation when you're in the hood. Mm-hmm. Nobody cares that you're thinking about peaceful resolution as opposed to taking it back to the block. And so after that experience with my son, I really was like, I actually need therapy to really process like what I had been through uh, because a lot of it was being covered up with achievements, right? I got out, I was successful relatively early on. You know, I've achieved, uh, you know, probably an exceptional level of success in pretty much all the endeavors I set out to do. And that covered up what was actually, the reality is that I was in prison for 19 years. Mm -hmm. I was in solitary. Nobody leaves that place without scars. Mm. And it doesn't matter if you've been in there for one day or 10 days or 10 years, that place scars you in a way that shows up in different areas of your life later on. And you're retelling those stories over and over again, like you said, in interviews, and talking about the book and reliving it all the time. Yeah, absolutely. You know, when when writing my wrongs came out, you know, I was on tour, I was doing all the things. I had, you know, the conversation with Oprah and, you know, all the things that, that come with promoting a, a product. But then I also was a sought after speaker. I had did a TED talk in like 2014 and from there, universities and schools. And so I'm just constantly talking about what I actually went to prison for, which was murder. And I had never reconciled that, you know, and so, I found myself in this in this real dark space and it kind of culminated with me driving down the wrong side of the expressway drunk one night and I was like, yo, I'm about to throw it all away. And that's when all the things just started coming back. Like, yo, you, you've been traumatized in a way that you haven't been honest about because who the hell talks about uh, PTSD post-incarceration? We're just happy to get out, celebrate, have the parties, get back to living mm-hmm. or, you know, this dream we concocted. Uh, but the reality is a lot of us come home deeply scarred. And, and it's really, you know, you think about those stories of somebody coming out and then they create or commit a heinous act of violence. We're like, see, we should have left them in. But the reality is we have to ensure that people are getting the therapeutic treatment right. so that they can come home healthy and whole. Could you, could you tell people how important it is for folks who have, who have done, you know, a lot of prison time to, to get mental health treatment? Because I always say they call these facilities correction facilities, but you're not correcting nothing no. in there. In order for a person to get out and not just operate out of that survival mentality, um, they need help, you know, and and we have to destigmatize what mental health treatment looks like, especially for black males. Uh, It's not a weak thing. It's not something that makes you a sucker or you soft. 
it's really healthy to be able to process the things that you're thinking about in a way that isn't harmful to your community, isn't harmful to your family. And, you know, when you come out of an environment that violent, you've been affected by that. You know, you're on edge. Like, I mean, my, my first part of my incarceration, I was at the Michigan Reformatory. It's called the Gladiator School. Mm. You know, my first week, my first actual day in prison, a guy gets stabbed in the neck and he keep it moving. I'm like, okay, well, this is what it is. This is where we at. This is the land of the lions and the lambs. And you make a choice early on. And like, that doesn't leave just because you walk out of prison. Like, it doesn't leave just because you get parole. Uh, those realities are still there. And, and so, you know, I think it's, it's an exceptionally important for uh, anybody who's been through that to get, you know, psychological evaluation, first of all, and then mental health treatment. You know, you said something earlier that, you know, when your son was older, you, you figured that you would have to fall back for a little bit, right? I have two sons, and what made me really think about that is, you know, as a kid, when your dad tells you to do something, like, you're mad. Like, mm -hmm. why is he making me do this, right? <laughs> right. Then when you get older, you understand why. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, but, you know, the, the, what scares me sometimes is, you know, thank God I went the right way where I didn't have to, I didn't have to learn why he was telling me no so hard. Mm. Does that ever scare you with your kids? You know what I mean? Because yeah, you have to fall back. You got to let your son learn on his own. And one day he'll get to the age, you'll be like, I understand what my dad was doing. But it's always that fear of what if he goes the wrong way? You know, mm. what, what if he goes that, takes that wrong turn or does that stupid thing? You know, he might not get that grace, that empathy. Yeah, I, I think, you know, the way that I've approached parenting is I honestly have egoless parenting. Because I realized that whatever outcomes my son, you know, has in life, those will be based on choices that he make. So my responsibility as his dad is to set up all the resources necessary, the guiding principles, but ultimately he's gonna have to choose. And I base that on, you know, my experience with my dad and knowing that my dad, you know, wanted the best for me and he wanted the best for all of his kids. Mm -hmm. But there were things that had transpired in my life that my dad didn't even understand how to help me process which led to me running away, led to me getting caught up in the streets. And, you know, one of the one of the things that was really important with me and my dad was for me letting him know that he wasn't responsible for the decisions I made uh, that led to me being in prison. And that was a liberating moment for both of us. And so with my son, I just do egoless parenting. Like, you know, I provide the resources, the opportunities, and ultimately he's going to have to make the decisions. And, like, I don't have any ego attached to his outcomes. Why, why is the, the relationship with our fathers so complicated because that's that's the one thing you know for me even when i started going to therapy for anxiety and depression realizing all these father issues mm. i have why why is that so complicated that relationship you know I, th I think there's a few things that that has happened specifically with black men for one our narrative have been has been shrunken to us only being capable of providers and if there was any um struggle with provision then that's a direct attack on manhood mm -hmm. and any other a uh, male figure is is a threat to that. You know, with my dad, my dad, when he met my mom, she had three children. He is just out of the Air Force, 21 years old. So he went straight into provision mode, and then they had three more children. Um, and, and I have a deeper appreciation now, as and I have one, one son and just realized how hard it is uh, to be a provider. But I think because that narrative has been so limiting, uh, it hasn't allowed us the opportunities to have real meaningful conversations. And what happened with me and my dad is probably about, you know, four or five years into my incarceration, I started really maturing. And we were able to just have deep, meaningful conversations. It was all through letters, uh, which is the inspiration of the book. And these are actually my daddy, my dad. I'm like my daddy. Uh, my daddy's letters. <laughs> That's the end of child talk. <laughs> yeah, no, right. Man. These are actually his letters on the book uh, because I really wanted to honor uh, how he showed up in that meaningful way. But, you know, I think that the more honest we are with what our emotional needs are, but also with our ability to provide beyond, you know, finances and, and discipline, I think the more we open up those conversations, the better relationships become between uh, fathers and sons. All right, well, don't move. We got more with Shaka Sagor. When we come back, it's The Breakfast Club. Good morning. I don't want to go unless you make Morning, everybody. It's DJ Envy, Angela Yee, Charlemagne the Guy. We are The Breakfast Club. We're still kicking it with Shaka Sengor. You know, he's the New York Times bestselling author for Writing My Wrongs and has a new book called Letters to the Sons of Society, A Father's Invitation to Love, Honesty, and Freedom. Yee. Shaka, mm -hmm. can you talk about how instrumental your father's support was for you while you were in prison? Because imagine not even having that. 
You know, I mean, my dad was my primary supporter. We don't we don't hear that story. You know, for 19 years, my dad came to see me at prisons all over Michigan. Uh, I think the farthest I've ever been away was about 12 hours, and he and my stepmom they would travel um, up to see me. You know, he wrote me consistently. I still have all his letters. Um, you know, he took those phone calls. You know, he, you know, was present with the real conversations. You know, there was a lot of hurt that we both shared. You know, there was a lot of areas of life where I felt, you know, he hadn't stood up, you know, the way that I thought he could have to protect us and make sure we were good uh, when it came to things that was difficult in the household. And he was just man enough to listen and to give us a perspective, and well, to give me a perspective. And we were able to talk. And so, you know, I celebrate him and everything that I do. You know, that's my guy. Uh, the proudest part of this book is just having his words, like to my son on there, you know? Um, and because I think dads deserve their flowers, you know, and they deserve more than the big piece of chicken. <laughs> <laughs> what, what did you yeah. learn about your relationship with your father, you know, from from, from the letters he sent you while you were in prison? Man, it, you know, I learned that I had broke his heart, you mm. know, and that was that was crushing to me. Like I was an honor roll scholarship student. I was smart, uh, very charismatic, like all the things, you know, you were wanting a child. And I, I really learned that I broke his heart. And that was the hardest thing for me to navigate, you know, as I matured into a man and especially as I've grown into a dad. And, you know, I think about moments with my son where I'm watching him, you know, navigate life. And, you know, I'm thinking of all the promise that he has, you know, and I think about my dad and what that experience was like for him uh, to watch his first biological son in an environment where he couldn't protect, he couldn't help, he couldn't do anything other than listen. And I remember this one moment when I when I was in solitary, I wrote this letter home and I told my dad, you know, I was in solitary for assaulting an officer. And, you know, I told my dad, I said, you know, these people said I'm never getting out of prison. And they said I'm never getting out of solitary. And I believed it because my neighbor across me had been in solitary for 20 years. Mm. My neighbor next door had been in solitary for 10 years. And I told my dad, I was like, man, you know, I really just want you to go on with your life and take care of Jay and, you know, take care of family and I'll figure this out in here, you know? And my dad wrote me back. He was like, I'd never leave your side, you know? And um, so, I, you know, as, as a man, as a dad now, I understand exactly what that meant, you know? And I understand how heartbreaking it was for him to have to be in a situation where the only thing he had was the letters that he could send me to nurture me and support me. And I read those letters over and over, man. During my toughest moments, I would just go back to those letters and uh, read them, so. So when you, went, when, you, when you went to prison, did he feel like he failed? Oh, absolutely. It, it, was, mm. it was hard, bro. He felt like it was his, his fault. Mm. He felt like there was something that he didn't do or something that he missed. And I think, you know, all of us as parents play Monday morning, quor Monday morning quarterback where we kind of go back like, you know, oh, if I would have did this, the outcome would have been different. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I, we had a moment, I think it was 1995, and this probably was the hardest visit I've ever been on with my dad. I was in solitary for something different at that time, and they had me shackled up, like this, the handcuffs on, but also the shackles on my feet. And I'm literally walking up to the window, and I see my dad looking at me. And I see him trying to hold it together. You know what I'm saying? But his heart is breaking. Like, I'm literally, like, shackled up. Like, I just got off, you know, a, a, a ship, you know what I'm saying, that, that held our ancestors in slavery, you know? And, you know, just watching him process that and try to figure out how to bring me a sense of peace, you know, the little jokes, the little conversation, you know? So that that during, it was during that visit that we had the conversation where he thought he was responsible, and I was like, I was like, no, nah, like, you know, there was a series of things that happened. Like, I was dealing with PTSD. I got shot uh, 17 months before I ended up shooting and taking somebody's life. What about the art of writing letters? Because you said your dad still writes letters to this mm -hmm. day. Uh, what would you say to people? Because it's not something that people do too often, but it mm -hmm. means so much. I think it's one of the greatest forms of communication. You know, I think the intimacy that's required for you to really sit and be present and think about what you want to share with another human being it's just so um, powerful, you know, because it allows you to reflect deeply. And, you know, when I when I first came up with the idea, as I mentioned, I was thinking about writing to like all the sons I've encountered. But when I sat down and I started writing, you know, I saw the faces of my boys. Mm -hmm. You know, I heard their voices and I thought about little mannerisms and, 
you know, the beauty of who they are. You know, I closed the the end of it, uh, you know, the book out with, with one of the passages I think is one of the most beautiful. And it just talks about how the swagger of their, you know, their nature and how they walk the earth, you know, and I think it's so important for black boys, especially in these times, to really hear that from their dads, you know, and from other men and that we have to affirm them and lift them up. And so that that intimacy of writing, um, you know, it was really refreshing, you know, and it, and it was actually healing for me as well because what I realized is that we always hear we have to change the narrative around black men. Mm-hmm. And I don't believe that to be true. I think we just have to expand the narrative to include all of who we are. That's right. Like not just the not just our negative moments. You know, one of my mentors, Travian Shorters, he always talks about how we have to start asset framing each other and thinking about what what is the most positive aspects of us. And in my experience, like all my friends are dope dads. You know, the, the friends I talk about in the book, my guy Fame, I think I tell y'all, he came to your car show. Mm-hmm. Uh, he brought that big red Caprice. Uh, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. My, my guy Calvin, uh, who I met, my best friend I met in prison. He With was the big in, ass rims on it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yep. My guy Calvin, who did 24 years for a crime he didn't commit, uh, you know, he's been out now. So these are, my, these are my guys. They're like dope dads, you know. My brothers, my cousins. So I'm used to seeing men who show up. And so I just think we have to expand the narrative, include all of us. Because if you think about this, right? What if my story would have stopped mm-hmm. at 1991? Right. You know, I wouldn't be one of the only C-suite tech execs uh, in Silicon Valley. I wouldn't be one of the only formerly incarcerated investors, a best-selling author, you know, a dad, a community builder. Like, I wouldn't have been none of these things if my narrative would have stopped back when people was okay with defining me from that moment. You know, I've lived tons of life in the 11 years I've been out, you know, and so my narrative has expanded and I've been able to contribute in a, in a real way. And so I think we have to just expand the narrative for black men and especially amongst each other, like seeing each other as more than what we've accomplished, you know, seeing the humanity of who we are and all we're capable of. And so that's what, you know, I, I really wanted to present in the book. Well, Shaka, letters to the son of society that's and right. father's invitation to love, honesty, and freedom. We appreciate we'll you get for that. joining us, brother. Man, appreciate y'all, man. It's, it's been love. You got some uh, fantastic blurbs, too. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. We Kenya got, Barris, Angela yeah. Rye, Ben Horowitz, Van Jones. Yeah, my guy Ben. Shout out to Ben, man. That's, that's my bro, man. That's well, who put me on to the Silicon Valley vibe, you know? Yeah. All right. Well, it's the Breakfast Club. Good morning. All right. Morning, everybody. It's DJ right. MV, Angela Yee, Charlamagne the guy. We are the Breakfast Club. Let's get to the rumors. Let's talk our Las Vegas residency. This is the Rumor Report. With Angela Yee on the Breakfast Club. So listen up. Nah, 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 nah. Now this is a good one. Silk Sonic has announced that they are going to be doing a Las Vegas residency. They called it the sexiest party of the year. Anderson Pack posted the terms are locked and Vegas might not ever be the same. Jack, you're invited to the hottest show in Sin City. Hit the link in bio and get your tickets now. So that 13 date residency starts on February 25th. The last show is April 2nd. That's I'm dope. down. Okay. I'm gonna see that. Mm-hmm. Now they, they, they seem like they built for Vegas. <laughs> like it's like mm-hmm. like Silk Sonic is a Vegas group. Drop on the clues bombs for Silk Sonic. Man, you, you don't you feel like that album got slept on? Cause it's a, yeah. it was an incredible album. I did. I yeah. really like it. I was definitely vibing to it in the car. I feel like it just came and went. Like people didn't really gravitate toward that project the way they should have. I got to see what those numbers was looking like. All right, and Pharrell has announced a new lifestyle and design forward project with David Grutman. You know, he's Miami-based. They're doing a new resort part of the Atlantis Paradise Island. So that's mm-hmm. going to open in 2024. It's going to be about 400 rooms and suites, multiple restaurants and bars, along with recording studios. Shout to Pharrell, man. He's been doing a lot with David Grutman. I know they yeah. opened up that hotel in Miami. So he's he's doing a lot. Shout out to Pharrell. Good what time. up, 757? Mm-hmm. That sounds dope. I haven't been to the behind. I haven't been. I feel like I haven't been anywhere in a minute. All right. Now, Antonio Brown was on the I Am Athlete show with ex-NBA star Nick Young and former first round NFL draft pick uh, Jared Oldrick. And they talked about his future in the league and whether or not he has any regrets about how he ended things with the Buccaneers. Here's what he had to say about his mental health, because he said a lot of fans and experts have been referring to him as, quote, crazy. Everyone in the world got different form of reactions of what happened to them. And it's all based upon where you from, how you feel, and no one only gonna know that regards of who you is. And this is the thing with football players, mental health, and CTE is this. 
These guys are willing to do whatever it takes to make some oblig ob obligated game. But they're in the midst of those games, they're being mistreated. It's a lot of facts. Stuff that yeah. went on that may not have been handled right. And then you in it, you starting your career on the high. If we all players and we all saying we care about mental health, why every time something happened bad or how someone react, oh he's crazy, there's something wrong with his mental health. It's nothing wrong with my mental health. Yeah, I think it's because a lot of folks are still just learning about CTE. So whenever they see, you know, any actions that they may deem as crazy, they already automatically assume it just because he's a football player, you know, something's wrong with him in, in that regard. And people also don't know what goes on behind the scenes. So that's all right. they see is what happened. They don't mm -hmm. know what led up to it, like you said. Yeah, and I, 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 that's how I felt too when I saw him on the sidelines. I'm like, yeah, he looked like he just made a choice to me. He didn't look like he was having no mental breakdown. He just made a choice. I was just waiting to see what he had to say about it later before you pass judgment. He was out. All right, now Fat Joe was also on the I Am Athlete podcast, and he was uh, talking about basically fake friends and getting rid of them and what his plan was. I would have 50 guys with me. We all had the same Cadillac truck. We all had chains. Everybody go to jail. I bail them out. I pay for the lawyer. This, 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 that. One time I sat all 50 of them together. We was at the Ritz Carlton in Puerto Rico. And I said, yo, listen, man, shit ain't the same. I ain't got it. And I had it. Right. But I was checking See, them. Out of the 50 guys that was there, only six of them said, yo, if you dead broke, I'd be with you, man, no matter what, every day. <laughs> crazy, Those bro. are six guys that still with me now. So God put that in my head and said, yo, try these dudes, man. See if they really with you. They wasn't really with me. All right. In addition to that, he was talking about Jay-Z and uh, the lyrics from Feeling It. The hardest lyric in hip hop. Jay-Z's first album when he said Ooh. something something and we will be each other's crutches yep. Yep. so the point is this everybody want to be the guy everybody look up to there's no real strength in that the strength is everybody eating so if that one of us falls we can lift them up whether your friend is a barber we want him to be the best barber in the world we need to be the best so that when we need each other mm. somebody's there for us right. we all right. there and that's the true power the people power. Joe is absolutely right, but Joe, you can't something something that scripture. Well, here's the lyrics. <laughs> you right. can't do that, Joe. Here's you the have to right know here. if everybody in your click is rich, your click is rugged. We have it for you. If every nigga in your click is rich, your click is rugged. Nobody will fall because everyone will be each other's crutches. I hope you fools choose to listen. I drop you and bust it. These are the rules I follow in my life. You gotta love it. Jiggy, come on, Joe. You can't stop. Joe, Joe. Because they ain't talking about large money. Joe, you can't something something scripture. What's the point? That's scripture. Joe. All right. Well, in the next hour, we'll tell you more about what Fat Joe had to say. One of the things that he discussed is who, no matter what, is his favorite rapper. Can we play that Jay Z song? Can we pull that up right fast? Ooh, All right. That's you your play rumor report. You do what you want to do. All right. Let's do it. What's, you, what's your name? Give him a moment. DJ Envy. Now, come on. What's your government that's name? Right, that's what I said. Can you find it, Rick? How long you been DJing? He long time. Cry don't ask no questions to play no music. Right, so let's tease the donkey. Who, who you giving your donkey to? Come on, Ray. You got President uh, Joe Biden, <laughs> Joe Manchin, and Kristen Cinema. President Biden, President Manchin, and Vice President Cinema are all getting donkey today this morning. There's no feeling it. We ain't got an assistant. Oh, uh, damn. Well, come on. You better ask for permission. You look bad. You, you better to ask for uh, forgiveness than permission. permission. Yeah. Come on. I guess we're not, not feeling it. We're not <laughs> feeling it. <laughs> not this? <laughs> nah. Not there? No. Well, I guess their crew's not rugged. No. Damn. Well, we fell, guys. We de <laughs> definitely fell. We should have no thought up. about this before. <laughs> Damn it, man. Now, really? I'm trying to. No. It's, it's not, not there. It's not oh, there. The water. All right. Donkey the Day is up next. It's the Breakfast Club. Good morning. Give it to Andy. The Breakfast Club. Your mornings will never be the same. Our audible pick of the day is the perfect day to boss up. This is Rick Ross's guide to building your own empire. Now listen up. Your first 30 days of Audible are free when you sign up at audible.com slash breakfast club. This is America. There is no question that there are problems in this country between police and community. Yes, you are a donkey. The latest on that police killing of a black man. Now to new developments in the deadly spa shooting rampage. Uh, and yesterday was a really bad day for him, and this is what he did. And so we are in a state of emergency. Okay, white supremacist violence is and always has been the number one threat to our society. But I'm also very proud that my wife is white. My wife is white. 
the, the Breakfast Club, bitches. All right, Charlene, please tell me, why was I your <clears throat> donkey of the day? Hey, donkey of the day for Thursday, January 20th, goes to the 46th president of the United States of America, Joe Biden, uh, as, as well as Arizona Senator uh, Kirsten Sinema and West Virginia Senator Joe Manchin. These three are collectively responsible for the death of the Democratic Party as we know it. Okay, Joe Biden and other Democrats love to run around and say, we have to go out there and vote like democracy depends on it. Uh, people are asking if we are witnessing the death of democracy in America. Well, guess what? If it is, which I believe it is for some of us, these three are to blame. Simple as that. Okay, if you haven't heard, last night Democrats came up short on a last ditch Hail Mary type of effort to advance a voting rights bill. Let me tell you something. You all know that your Uncle Charlotte is a diehard Dallas Cowboy fan. Okay? And I <laughs> shut up. And I really thought that Sunday night watching my Dallas Cowboys down 23-17 with 14 seconds left in the game and Dak Prescott running a draw play from the 41 yard line instead of maybe getting one or possibly two shots at the end zone off. I thought that was gonna be the dumbest finish <laughs> I would see this week. But President Biden said, hold my prune juice. All right. Now I'm going to keep this as simple as possible. Uh, since last summer, 19 states have enacted 33 laws that will make it hard for Americans to vote. By Americans, I mean niggas. All right. The blacks. All right. All these GOP sponsored state laws will suppress turnout by minority voters. This is an old tune, ladies and gentlemen. All right. Voter suppression by the GOP against black people is the greatest hit. All right, a golden oldie. Kids, trust me, it would break all screaming records. It is the Ed Sheeran shape of you of American politics. All right, President Biden knew that going in. And after the attempted coup of this country on January 6th, that should have been his first order of business, protecting voting rights. I've told y'all so many different times on this here radio and on other platforms, on TV and everything else. There's three or four things Joe Biden had to do to protect democracy. Okay, this morning I'll give you three. One, prosecute everyone involved in the attempted coup of this country to the highest extent of the law, not just the members of Vanilla ISIS who stormed the Capitol, but the members of Congress who helped him. Two, get rid of the filibuster so you can properly govern. And three, protect voting rights. Protect voting rights. But guess what? None of those things have happened, okay? I never understood why anyone thought it would. I mean, if you have the GOP passing, you know, uh, th th 33 laws in 19 states in support of voter suppression. Why would anyone in their right mind think that you could work with any of those people to pass voter rights legislation? It makes no sense. Republican politicians are the epitome of unity and group operation. They fall in line with each other. And if one doesn't fall in line, they get the business. OK, last week on NPR, Donald Trump called Mitch McConnell a loser and blamed him for the GOP senators who won't go along with his claims that the election was stolen. Last week, he also called out Arizona Republican officials for accepting the 2020 election results and called them rhinos, Republicans in name only. Why did Trump do that? Because those individuals blocked his agenda, kept him from getting done what he wanted to get done. That's what you should do when people in your own party are blocking your agenda. Now, we all know Trump is doing that for self-serving reasons. So if you can call out people in your party for self-serving reasons and everyone is fine with it, then why can't President Biden call out Joe Manchin and Kristen Sinema for blocking his agenda when them blocking his agenda is actually hurting the American people? OK, if you ask me, it's because he don't care. Black people voting is simply not a priority for Biden. Manchin or Sinema. Simple as that. This should have been a priority. He had to know this day would come, but he didn't care. Why? My man Sean King said it best on Instagram last night because Joe Biden has never known a day in his life what it means to have his voting rights threatened. All right. It's a matter of white privilege for Biden. He failed to give this issue the true energy and priority that it deserved because he simply can't relate. Same with Cinema and Manchin. They have never experienced their voting rights threatened and they don't need you Negroes to win elections. So why should they care? Well, Manchin and Cinema. why should they care? Biden needs to care. By the way, we knew the jig was in when last year uh, GOP legislators praised Manchin and Cinema for not getting rid of the filibuster because without that, they would be dead meat. Let me play this for you again. I played it for you a few times last year, but now that y'all might be paying a little bit more attention, this is GOP legislators praising Joe Manchin and Cinema for basically being on their side. This was last year. Listen. Fortunately for us, the filibuster is still in effect in the Senate. Without that, we would be dead meat. Mm -hmm. But thank goodness for Cinema and, and Joe Manchin. Yeah, I, I just really thank you for standing for the country. And you know, all of you in this room, people at home on Zoom, let me tell you right now, if you want to do one thing to, to keep the republic af afloat, 
call Joe Manchin's office, call <laughs> Kristen, Sinema's off, Kristen Sinema's office, be polite. He's like, hi, I'm here to talk to Senator Joe Manchin and thank him for keeping the filibuster intact. Mm, 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 mm. Those GOP legislators, they didn't even know they were being recorded. All right, uh, Joe Biden gave a statement yesterday after the failed vote to change the filibuster. He said, uh, let me read some of it. He said, I am profoundly disappointed that the Senate has failed to stand up for our democracy. I am disappointed, but I am not deterred. We will continue to advance necessary legislation and push for Senate procedural changes that will protect the fundamental right to vote. <clears throat> End quote. I don't know if it's because he's old or maybe he really doesn't care, but I never hear the sense of urgency. It's literally always more urgency for us to go out there and vote than it is for elected officials to protect voting rights. All you're about to hear for the next however many months before the midterms is how we have to have the largest voter turnout in the history of the midterms in order to protect democracy. How we have to vote like democracy depends on it, but they never, ever govern like democracy depends on it. You are going to hear you have to go out there and vote because if votes didn't matter, why are they fighting so hard to take them from you? Yes, that is true. But you know what else matters? When you're when you're an elected official getting things done. When you're an elected official who keeps campaign promises. You want me to get up and fight through all these various voter suppression efforts. In some cases, literally fight to keep an administration in that hasn't done what they said they were going to do. Not keeping campaign promises is a form of voter suppression, okay? Now, let me tell you something. I'm going to vote in the midterms and the presidential election. I don't know who I'm voting for. I don't even know what I'm voting for yet, but I'm going to vote. OK, but if you don't want to, I understand. And for all the folks out there who are going to push people to vote, like actively go out there and campaign for folks. What are you going to tell them? That's what I want to know. What are you going to tell them? The Biden administration has armed you with nothing. Ten thousand for student loan debt didn't happen. George Floyd Policing Act didn't happen. Build Back Better didn't happen. OK, voting rights didn't happen. All right. I know it's only been a year, but none of those things have happened. But voting rights, the cornerstone of our democracy didn't happen. And it's because the real leaders of this country, Joe Manchin and Kristen Sinema, Democrats, allegedly, it's because they are false flagging. And since they are false flagging, are the Democrats going to attempt to run them off the set? Are they going to run someone to challenge Joe Manchin's seat? What about Kristen Sinema? I don't even know how that works. But I know when someone not really in your gang and they false flagging, you let it be known then. All right. They won't even let it be known. They won't even call them out on how they are blocking progress because Democrats are willing to try every political strategy except honesty and courage. The moral of the story is. And I really need to take a drink of water before I say this, because this has really been on my mind. Mm. The moral of the story is what I really want to say on this radio this morning. This is Lenard McKelvey, Charlemagne the God talking. I just want Joe Madison to eat. Joe Madison is a radio personality on Sirius XM, and him and some pastors, they went on a hunger strike until voting rights was passed in Congress. I need you all to go get some shrimp and grits right now, okay? Joe Madison hasn't eaten in like 60 plus days. No solid foods until Congress passes voting rights. That's what Joe Madison said. Joe, it's time to eat. I don't know that brother, don't think I ever met him, but when I saw him on MSNBC over the holidays and I saw him saying he was on a hunger strike, until they pass voting rights in Congress, first thing I thought was, man, those white folks don't care if you starve, okay? Oh, it was around the holidays when I saw him too. I said, damn, this is a hard time to not eat. And he's, he's, he's staking his not eating on whether voting rights get passed? Listen, I applaud y'all faith in these people, but that Democrat diet, that fascist fast, it isn't healthy. So please go eat, Brother Joe Madison, and all the pastors who went on a hunger strike until voting rights passed, please go eat. Get a big meal this morning, some shrimp and grits, all right, maybe some corned beef, hash, and eggs, okay? I've really been thinking about y'all. I promise you last night, that was the first thing on my mind. I was in a few group chats telling folks that know y'all to please tell those brothers to go eat. I would even cash out them some change for some breakfast or some lunch this morning because voting rights legislation and democracy may have died on the Senate floor last night, but we can't let y'all die from starvation too all right so please let Remy Ma give President Joe Biden Senator Kristen Sinema and Senator Joe Manchin the biggest hee-haw 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 you stupid mother are you dumb I'm sure this won't be the last we'll be mm. discussing this but but for real Joe Madison please go eat my brother mm -hmm. please is Kanye running again man shut up
All right. Up next, ask he. 800 Niggas don't take nothing serious. And that's why these things happen. That's why they make movies like Don't Look Up. Okay? For niggas like you. Exactly. All right? I'm curious if Kanye is You know what? Again. You know what? You know what, what nigga? You what? don't deserve voting rights. All right? <laughs> See? Or no food. See? Okay? No food? Give me all your Chinese food. Pass it all. <laughs> Give me everything. Everything over there. Pass it. Okay? A ask you have Chinese No food? shrimp fried rice. All right. No lo mein. No five, eight, five, okay, no five, egg rolls. One. No nothing. All, All right. right. Up next is Ask Yee. If you need relationship advice, any type of advice, call Yee right now. It's the Breakfast Club. Good morning. What, 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 what you want to know? Baby mama issues? Need some words of wisdom? Call up now for Ask Yee. 800-585-1051. The Breakfast Club. Come on, Relationship advice? Need personal advice? Just need real advice? Call up now for Ask Ye. Keep the bread. Morning, everybody. It's DJ NV, Angela Yee, Charlamagne the Guy. We are the Breakfast Club. It's time for Ask Ye. Hello, who's this? This is Joe from uh, Detroit. How's it going, NV? What up, Doe, man? What's your question for Yeezy? Yeah, quick question. So, uh, I'm, I'm, in, I'm dating this girl, and she pretty much gave me the ultimatum like look if we don't if I can't move in we can't be together no more what so, so what should I do should I should I stay in the situation I mean I want to be with her but it's like but you don't want to move that's in just moving too, that's just moving too fast to me you know but if she gives you an ultimatum and it's not something you want to do you have to say no how long you been dating her though <laughs> about a year now yeah and that doesn't matter though because if you don't want to move in with somebody and she gives you an ultimatum saying, I can't be with you unless we move in together. You can't compromise that. I mean, that's a big deal, sharing space. And I think that, you know, what's the next move after that? If you're not ready, you can't let somebody force you into something. Yeah, see, I, 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 I'm kind of feeling the same way. Like, it was like one of those things, the first time she was going to my house, I woke up, she was going through all my stuff. Like, look, this what? what I do. She was like, this is what I do. She was like, look, if you're going to date me, this is, look, I'm going through your stuff. We got to live together. Otherwise, I'll find another dude to replace you. I'm like, what? Wow. You- <laughs> well, sounds like she needs a place to stay. <laughs> I appreciate that. I appreciate that. Yeah. Well, and imagine somebody even telling you that. That sounds awful to tell you, oh, if you don't let me move in with you, I'll find somebody else who will. That's not the type of relationship you want to be in. See, I, I thought it was one of those situations where she was just, you know, basically playing hard to get or just, you know, <laughs> I, don't, I don't even know. <laughs> Yeah, that sounds like some red flags. And let me tell you something. If you're moving with somebody who you don't want to be with, you can't even find peace at home. Imagine you don't even feel like coming home. She's going through your stuff. And she's questioning everything that you do. That's, you know, home is like your peace, your haven. You don't even want to have to deal with that. I appreciate that. I appreciate the advice. Much love, y'all. Much love, y'all. Y'all have a good morning. All right. Have fun being single. Ask ye 800-585-1051. If you need any type of advice, call her now. It's The Breakfast Club. Good morning. Well, Here's some real advice with Angela Yee. It's Ask Ye. Morning, everybody. It's DJ Envy, Angela Yee, Charlamagne the Guy. We are The Breakfast Club. We're in the middle of Ask Ye. Hello, who's this? Hey, my name is James. James, what's up? What's your question for Yeezy? Hey, man. First of all, I just want to say, man, I really, I really love you guys. Everything that you guys do, I listen to you guys all the time, every day. But um, basically, yeah, I just need some advice. I'm going through some relationship troubles with my girl. Um, uh, to start off the new year, she told me that she's feeling depressed and she doesn't want to be together. She feels like she needs to be by herself. Mm-hmm. And um, it's just really hard for me because... I feel the complete opposite. I really love this woman, and I devoted my whole life to her. And I really thought she was going to be the one I was going to spend the rest of my life with. So I just need help getting through this, man. Because well, she, if it's, you it's love so her, hard for me. and she's expressed to you that she's depressed, then you have to support how she is. If you really love and care about her, um, have you seen the signs of depression that she's talking about? I don't. I don't like. I see that sometimes she. I, it feels like she struggles with what she's going on right now in life like like she just doesn't know the career that she's doing if it's mm-hmm. going off right if if everything that we did i guess we rushed into everything we're both young she's 26 i'm 23 uh-huh. like i don't know if that plays into the role of everything but, but like i understand what you're saying like you know i have to support her 
but it's so hard when I genuinely don't want to be away from her and I love right. her, you know? Yeah. And, and you know, that's hard. And the best thing that you can do, though, is be patient, right? If it's meant to be and if you love her and she does truly love you, we have to be uh, able to stand as individuals before we can be in a successful relationship. And so I think for her, she needs to build herself up and do what she needs to do. All you can do is offer her your support and help. And when I mean help, I mean like maybe direct her to some resources that you feel like might be good. Let her know that you care about her, whatever decision that it is that she makes. Let her know that you're there for her. You can be a friend right now. You know, like you said, and you agree that you feel like you rushed into things? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I mean, under the circumstances that we were in, you know, I agree. Like, she had just gotten out of a bad relationship right. when me and her. And, yeah, I feel like that could play a role into everything. Yeah, so she's not completely healed from that. Is she getting some type of help? Um, Honestly, I don't, I don't know. I don't think so. Just because she's always so busy, she's in... She's in RN school trying to get her RN. She's currently in LPN, so she mm -hmm. works all night, overnight, and then in the That's morning tough. she's at school, and then she has to sleep, you know, at some point. Right. Well, any nice gestures that you can do for her, whether that's like sending her a breakfast or, you know, just little nice things, maybe uh, writing her nice messages, letting her know, but without being too pushy, because she has expressed to you she's going through something, she's told you that she needs space, so you should respect that. But you can also, at the same time, try to be supportive as a friend because if you care about her, you care about her health and well-being as well. No, yeah, I, I, I understand. Thank you. I appreciate it. Okay. I just want to say again, like, I really I really love you guys. Thank you so much for everything you do. I really appreciate it. And Charlemagne, man, you, you're the man. And Envy, you're awesome. you King. You're amazing. I love listening to you guys. Thank you so All much, right, brother. All right, thank you. He seems like a sweet guy. Ask Ye, 800-585-1051. Now you got rumors on the way? And speaking of love, Machine Gun Kelly talks about the ring that he designed for Megan Fox, her engagement ring, and she can't take it off without hurting herself. All right, we'll get into that next. It's the Breakfast Club. Yeah. It's about time. What's going on? Yeah. Yeah. Rumor report. Rumor report. This is the rumor report with Angela Yee on the Breakfast Club. All right, well, Fat Joe, like we were talking about earlier, was on the I Am Athlete podcast. He was talking about getting rid of fake friends by pretending to be broke. Uh, he was also discussing the feeling it lyrics from Jay-Z. And another thing he said is his favorite rapper is yay no matter what. Kanye is my favorite rapper in the world, and I love him to death. What you mean he's I, your favorite rapper? He's my Damn. favorite rapper. Why you keep... He's been my me? favorite rapper. So, But what I'm saying to you is, and I won't turn my back on him, mm -hmm. no matter what he do. Right, right. Kanye the hallway, he's a genius, he's incredible, and I'm okay. A lot of people we cool with, they, 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 they don't vote like us, or they don't, they, they don't agree with everything. But we got with him. He made Jesus walks. <laughs> he made Jesus walks. Good enough reason. <laughs> I never heard Fat Joe say Kanye was his favorite rapper. That's well, a new one. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's and that was on new. Brandon Marshall's podcast, right? What's the name of the podcast? Do we know. I am athlete. I am athlete. Yes. Yeah, that's oh, what I, I said. I've heard Fat Joe say Nas was his favorite rapper. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, speaking of Nas, Nas has invested in African mobile games publisher Carry First in a financing round raising $20 million. So he's joining other people in uh, this investment. You know, he's been doing some amazing investments. And so that uh, his, his, that's with his, cap, his venture capital firm, Queensbridge Venture Par Partners. He's also invested in Dropbox, Lyft, Robinhood, Coinbase, and things like that. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. So shout out to Drop him. Drop one of Clues Bombs for Nasir. That's amazing, right? I think that does encourage other people, too, because it is uh, really a way to get rich is to invest in these tech companies. And I know you may not be able to get in on that ground floor, but we've been talking so much about stocks and investments. So this is just one example of things that are possible. Now, um, one thing, Envy, you just saw was T.I., and you said he was doing stand-up comedy? Oh, yeah, I seen something that Jasmine Brand posted that they said T.I. was doing uh, stand-up comedy last night. I don't know. I didn't hear it. I just seen it and I thought it was interesting. Oh, yeah? So that's not an easy thing to do, though. We've seen a lot of people hit that stage. So what I want to do is, uh, do we have the audio? Because this is something that just got posted on the Jasmine Brand a few months ago. But No, it's no audio. Up. A few minutes ago, you mean? Oh, yeah, a few minutes ago. So uh, they said he just added stand-up uh, to his resume, and he's just getting started. So... 
that should be something interesting to see. Now, Bobby Schmurter was on Million Dollars Worth of Game, and they had a welcome home party for him. I know y'all saw this audio. It seemed like he was having an amazing time dancing with Gillian Wallow. He fell off the couch and everything. Mm -hmm. But he also talked about the first thing that he did uh, when he came home. How was your welcoming home? Was it was it like, we gonna be 100? I f like 10 bitches that day. But like 10, I put like six bitches on the jet. I f like two bitches. I smoked like. Jesus oh, you just came home eating raw batches? Yeah, you know what I'm saying? Right on the jet. Ah, he came he raw I came home to this smelly. <laughs> He Yo, six home. years, bro. Six years, bro. <laughs> ain't nobody coming. Ain't nobody doing a half a decade and not come on eating no. <laughs> no, he came on trying to suck his own. <laughs> <laughs> get the <laughs> out of here. Whoa, whoa, thank you. Not on do. <laughs> I think there's a, a a bitch minimum. I don't know. I think there's like a two bitch minimum. Uh, we gotta start on. believing him. Drop one of the clues bombs for a million dollars worth of game. <laughs> That looked like a fun uh, episode. Interview, yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, now, uh, Taja posted this, a woman named Taja Riley, and she was talking about the Super Bowl halftime show. She posted a message that she had received, and it says, Hello, Taja, my husband told me that the Super Bowl is recruiting volunteers to dance for no pay. I also heard that production of the Super Bowl halftime performance reached out asking if they had any dancers on their roster who would be interested in volunteering and performing for no pay. I'm surprised that Block LA actually considered and emailed their roster of the Super Bowl situation. They should have said no, especially because Block was originally the main agency with an audition invite for Fatima and Adrian as paid dancers. We saw the close call on their Instagram. This is all bad. Now, Taja Riley posted this on her page and said, I'm sure I don't have to explain, but the Super Bowl is the most profitable global sporting event on any given year. Why be cheap? especially on such an incredibly important performance honoring and showcasing African-American talent. What do you guys think about that? With the Super Bowl asking for people to just basically volunteer to dance for the halftime show and not paying the dancers. I mean, they can ask for whatever they want. You ain't got to do it. Uh, yeah. They should be paying. They should pay the people, though. You know, uh, it's interesting, right? Like, because it's an opportunity. And if you're like an up-and-coming dance troupe you know what i mean you might take advantage of that opportunity millions of eyes on you it's kind of an it's an investment in yourself i'm not mad at it you know listen i'm as i get it it's business right so you always gonna try to get somebody to do something for free Absolutely. you know but um it is an opportunity right <laughs> you can pay them a little something though because as much money as they make at least a day rate or but do they make money because no dr dre pays for his own set and i thought the artists pay for their own sets and everything well, i'm thinking about the, how much the super bowl makes but they they i think Traditionally, the Super Bowl pays for your production and all of that, but they don't pay the artists because you get streams and you get all kinds of promotion right. from it. Super I thought we so, said. I thought we read something. He said, said he's paying for his own, but traditionally, what they do is they do pay for the production. Oh, got you, of got it. you. Yeah, Super Bowl don't care about that. Listen, they gonna give you that that budget, whatever that budget is, and the rest is on that game. Listen, I'm, I'm a stern believer in recognize an opportunity when it's not a paycheck attached to it. So I mean, you know. I, I wish they were offering some money, but if they're not, I don't know if that would keep me from doing it. Just depends on, you know, how much visibility I want. I guess y'all do less for for, for clout nowadays. Mm -hmm. You know, I know, but this requires like rehearsals. I mean, it's real work. It's the Super Bowl halftime show. It's really about what you want. Hey, I did a All lot right. oh, of we, work before getting paid. We do have we do have a clip of Ti doing stand up. By the way, can you be in a committed relationship and still have? <laughs> A friend from the opposite sex. Yes. Now if you f it, it don't count. <laughs> the ladies like, yes it do. It's the account. It's the account. Ladies cheat way better than us, so don't get into the game, okay? Because the shit is gonna be f up for you. Besides, cheat cheating is a big f game anyway, okay? Ooh, hold on, say that you got a little f don't keep that to yourself. <laughs> That's your little secret. <laughs> Okay, T.I. <laughs> no, T.I. <laughs> you know, that's fine coming on a podcast, but no, not to stand up. If that's expeditiously live, I'm mm -hmm. with it. If you're doing stand up, you got to sit down. Hey, I just flew into, <laughs> <laughs> I just flew into town, yeah, and boy, my am my arms tired. <laughs> <laughs> that's my guy, but if that's expeditiously Jeez. live, great. But if that's you doing stand up, leave it to Lil Duval, man. All right, well, that is Lord, your... Lord, have mercy. Rumor. Everybody got to start somewhere, though. <laughs> no, you don't. Not when you T.I., you already filthy rich. No, I'm saying if you want to do stand up comedy, <laughs> people just, do it because they love it. T.I. bored, bored. though, bro. Bored. I said this. just bored. <laughs> All right, people's choice mix up. A man walked into a bar. It hurt. It's the breakfast club in the morning. <laughs>
wake, wake, wake up, wake up, wake up, get up, wake up. You're checking out the Breakfast Club. Hey, what up, y'all? It's DJ Envy here. It's all fun and games till someone screenshots your message. Say goodbye to morning after guilt with that chat. This new encrypted social platform can help you stay truly private. No screenshots, recordings, or leaked messages. Get that chat for iPhone and Android at the App Store or find it at datchat.com forward slash envy. Morning, everybody. It's DJ Envy, Angela Yee, Charlamagne the Guy. We are The Breakfast Club. Good morning. Now, we got a shout to Shaka Sankor for joining us this morning. That's right. Make sure you go grab Letters to the Sons of Society, a father's invitation to love, honesty, and freedom. It's available everywhere you buy books right now. All right. When we come back, we got the positive notice to Breakfast Club. Good morning. Morning, everybody. It's DJ Envy, Angela Yee, Charlamagne the Guy. We are the Breakfast Club. All right. Charlamagne, you got a positive note? Yeah, you know, um, I was sitting there thinking about what we was talking about with the Super Bowl halftime show, right? And you know how they want some dancers to dance for free. And I'm a stern believer that, you know, you should always recognize opportunity when there's not a paycheck attached to it because one opportunity used wisely can change your life dramatically. So I guess my positive note is simply this, man. Um, It may cost you. You know, it may cost you to invest in yourself, but always remember, nothing is more expensive than a missed opportunity. Breakfast Club, bitches! Are y'all finished or y'all done?